Thank you. And our next item of business is topical questions. We we'll go to question number one from Christina McKelvey. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when powers over, so over social security benefits will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Minister Jean Freeman. <clears throat> the Scottish Government has consistently been clear that we will have a Scottish Social Security Agency delivering the 11 devolved benefits by the end of this parliamentary term. Our overriding priority has also been consistently stated, and that is the safe and secure transition of the devolved benefits. This is the biggest transfer of power since devolution began, not only because it is not a lift and shift transfer of a complete system, much as that is what we argued for. It is the transfer of responsibility for 15% of the payments made by an integrated welfare system that has itself developed in a piecemeal fashion over more than 50 years and is again itself currently undergoing further reform and change. The scale and the complexity is clear and everyone sitting in a democratic parliament knows that safely delivering this transfer is not possible without the underpinning of both a legislative framework and a robust delivery infrastructure. Members of the Social Security Committee will be well aware of the need to work closely with the DWP to make sure that the Scottish and the UK systems are aligned. That is, we are determined to work closely with the UK government to iron out issues and resolve the complexities, but we are also determined not to allow the important transfer of powers affecting 1.4 million people in Scotland to be used as a political football. Christina McKelvey. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that detail on the transition? Can the Minister tell us how the Scottish Government would ensure that no one transferring to any of the benefits that will be delivered by the Scottish Government slips through the gaps between the two systems in that transition? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Ms McKelvey has, of course, gone straight to the heart of what is important, and that is the safe and secure transfer of the devolved benefits. Making sure that every one of the 1.4 million people who rely on this support receive the money they are entitled to on the day that it is due. Throughout the three-month consultation that we have just finished, no one asked us to do this quickly. Everyone asked us to do it safely. So that is why the current experience groups with lived experience of the current benefit system and the other expertise that we will draw on are so important and why we will make sure this parliament has the time it needs to fully scrutinise the primary and secondary legislation that will be required before we can deliver the benefits. That is as it should be in the interests of people across Scotland. People, presiding officer, who wake up every day in a cloud of worry and anxiety brought on by the impact of the UK benefit system. So it is deeply disappointing that in recent days, both Tory and Labour have tried to score political points on the basis of unfounded assertions with an utterly careless disregard for the impact their words have on those people they claim to represent. Yeah. Christina McKelvey. Um, the, the Minister herself gets to the heart of the issue here, and it's about safety and security, and that's what people seek. So how will the Minister reassure those who have been victims of the conscious cruelty of the current system, those with motor neuron disease, those with long-term conditions, those with life-threatening con conditions? How can she reassure those people who have been affected by that conscious cruelty of this current system that any new system in Scotland will not just repli replicate those failures, but actually address some of the failures that these people have experienced. Minister. Thank you. I notice that Ms McKelvey uses the words of Paul Lafferty, the writer of I, Daniel Blake, to refer to the DWP's callous conditionality and benefit sanctions regime. There is a great deal, pre presiding officer, that we will learn from the experience of the DWP and the UK benefit system, not least a rush to give timescales and commitments that are persistently not met. If we take the example of Universal Credit, announced in uh, 2010, delivered in their act in 2012, and still not expected to be completed in its rollout until 2022. That is why not only the approach we have taken in the consultation of directly listening to those with lived experience of being in the benefit system and those with expertise working with them and those indeed working in delivering that benefit system is exactly the approach we will continue in the weeks and months following the consultation through the experience panels and the other matters that I've referred to. Unfortunately, with 15%, we cannot 
change all of the unfairness in the current system. But with the limited powers that we have, we are determined that we will take the time, we will listen, we will not be bullied into false timescales or deadline dates. And within the lifetime of this parliament, we will deliver a social security system for Scotland that everyone in Scotland can be proud of. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Minister, the Labour Party has supported you uh, when you've talked about a social security system with uh, fairness, dignity and respect at its heart. What I would ask then is why has the government chosen to delay assuming the powers and continuing a system which the government's own backbenchers are talking about, a system of conscious cruelty? Why the delay in leaving the powers with the DWP? Minister. I have to say to the member that delay to call this delay is to completely misunderstand the process of how you go about building a new public service. First of all, you need the legislative competence in order to bring before this parliament the legislative, the draft bill that you will be entitled to scrutinise, as will everyone else, which itself then forms the framework on which we can begin to deliver on executive competence. I am surprised, to be frank, that Labour has chosen to join the Tories in an attempt to use this situation for political posturing and to make political points. Yeah. And you have broken the consensus and the agreement that we had that we would work together on this matter. You should know, sir, full well, that we need to take the time not only to listen to those who are currently recipients of the benefit system, but also to put in place the significant infrastructure on which it will depend and that we need to test that infrastructure because the last thing I want and I would imagine the last thing you want is that a single person, a single one of those 1.4 million falls through a gap simply because members in this chamber are so concerned with the interests of their own political party and little concerned with the interests of those we're here to serve. Adam, Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If there is confusion, Minister, about uh, whether there is delay here, perhaps that confusion has been caused by the Scottish Government's refusal to explain to this Parliament in a timely manner what they are asking for in meetings of the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, the most re recent minutes of which disclose that it is Scottish ministers, not UK ministers, who have asked for something called split competence with regard to the transfer of uh, welfare uh, powers. So can the Minister explain for the benefit of this Parliament, for the first time, what exactly split competence is. Can the Minister clarify whether split competence will apply only to tranche two and not to tranche one? Can the Minister clarify what impact split competence will have on the timing of the transfer or commencement of powers under sections 22 and 23 of the Scotland Act? And finally, presiding officer, can the Minister, not, um, can the minister explain why none of this, none of it at all, was explained to the Social Security Committee until after Damien Green had given evidence to us on the 3rd of November. What do the ministers here have to hide? Minister. Presiding officer, that is quite astonishing. Mr Tompkins is a member of that Social Security Committee. Let me just read you a few words from the Cabinet Secretary's appearance before it on the 30th of June this year. That's a number of months away. It's unfortunate Mr Tompkins didn't have his listening ears on. It is important to distinguish between the commencement and the delivery of powers. The legal commencement of powers is the first stage in a process and is some distance away from the delivery of new or existing benefits. I think that is clear. I repeated it myself when I was there on the 29th of September. It has been repeated in debates in this chamber. So it is uh, unacceptable, if not to say downright disingenuous, for any member, particularly a member of the Social Security Committee, to claim that this is news to them, that this was unknown. It does apply to tranche two, and I have already explained the difference between executive, uh, legislative competence and executive competence. Legislative competence allows us to bring to this Parliament the draft bill which will be the framework on which we will establish a social security system for Scotland. Executive competence will allow us to then deliver the benefits within that system and from that agency. The difference is clear and I would have expected that someone of Mr Tompkins learning would have understood it. Neil 
Minister clearly has her brass neck on today because in 2014, the SNP told the Scottish people they could establish all the mechanisms and all the institutions of a new state within 18 months. And now we find out they can't even administer 11 benefits within the next three years. Was the claim made in 2014 a mistake? Was it a typo in that great organ of truth, the white paper? Or was it just a blatant attempt to mislead the voters? Minister. Oh dear, I have no brass neck on today, but I have to say Mr Finlay should be ashamed of himself. If he goes and reads that white paper, he will see that we were very clear that there would be a period of transition. If Mr Finlay would stop for one moment and pause and think less about himself and less about his own party and think about what it is required, I appreciate it some time since you were in power and you may have forgotten what is required in order to bring into being a new public agency for the first time in Scotland. It requires that we take the time to get it right, unlike the UK Tory government, and that we have first and last in our sights our attention to those 1.4 million people who will rely on us to deliver those benefits on time, in the right place, to the right account. For us, they are our first and last focus. How unfortunate that for neither Labour nor the Tories, that is not the case. Question number two, Graeme Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government whether powers will be removed from councils by its local government review, and if so, which? Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Ministerial colleagues and I are currently engaging with COSLA on a wide range of public service reform issues. We believe that local control by rather than on behalf of communities is key to delivering better public services and improving outcomes for all in Scotland. Scottish ministers are currently engaging with COSLA on a wide range of public re service reform issues. Our discussions will include consideration of the scope and timing of a, a re review of local government functions. That review will be an opportunity to build an emerging good practice to energise local democracy and to increase community empowerment. Graham Simpson. Thank the Minister for that response. The Times reported on Friday that ministers are planning a major assault on town halls with measures such as forcing councils to merge service, services, devolving services down to local areas and stripping councils of some areas of responsibilities such as roads. The idea of a national road service with no democratic accountability fills me with horror. The article further said that the plans were meant to be kept secret until after next year's council elections. And all this on top of raiding council coffers to pay for a national priority. Can I ask the minister for a straight answer to this? Was the article correct in any of its claims? And if not, can he guarantee that none of these things will happen? Minister. Uh, well, first of all, uh, we don't have town halls uh, in Scotland um, and you know I think that we should start from the very basic uh, knowledge of how we do business here. Um, local government is uh, essential to the health, well-being and prosperity of every community in Scotland and we hugely value uh, the work that local authorities do. Scottish uh, government and local government also share the same ambitions for stronger communities, a fairer society uh, and a thriving economy. And local government is, and always will be, an essential and equal partner in creating a fairer and more prosperous Scotland. And that includes being a key partner in our work on community empowerment. <coughs> Let me read you this, and I quote, we understand how difficult it is to throw off the shackles of the current way of looking at democracy. However, the reality is that if we are serious about making Scotland fairer, wealthier and healthier, then we need to start putting local communities in control of what matters to them. That was Councillor David O'Neill after publication of the Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy and Local Government. And I agree with Councillor O'Neill in that regard. Graeme Simpson. Well, thank you. Um, uh, the, the Minister has not actually answered the, the, the question that I asked. I asked, I asked him for a straight answer. 
So uh, I'll, I'll try again, um, shall we? Um, the article said that ministers, uh, presumably him, uh, are planning to force councils to merge services and strip councils of areas of responsibility such as roads. Is any of that incorrect? Now, can we just have a straight answer to that? And he mentions COSLA. Well, let's, let's look at COSLA. COSLA is so engaged with this government that it now doesn't even want to talk to you about the Educational Attainment Fund because you, you do not want to engage with, with the whole issue of democratic accountability. You've stripped that away from local government. Minister. Um, presiding officer, uh, like um, uh, Mr Simpson's knowledge of uh, local government, I would say uh, that much of the article in the Times uh, lacks knowledge too. As I've said already, we are engaging with COSLA at this moment in time. Um, and that, for me, is an opportunity to build on emerging good practice and to energise local democracy. What I entered politics for was to ensure uh, that people had a real say in the public services that are delivered. Not uh, public services that shouldn't be delivered to them, but public services that they have a real say uh, in uh, shaping. Now, that is what we intend to do. Uh, that has been the way that this government progressed during the course of the last parliament with the Community Empowerment Bill. We intend to go much further and we intend to do that in partnership with local government colleagues. Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. Does, does the Minister acknowledge that many local authority services are buckling at the seams under the financial pressure that they have been under for some time now. Over 27,000 jobs have gone in local government since uh, 2009. The demand on those services and the pressure on those services, however, have not reduced. So the, you can imagine the pressure that's on the staff that are absolutely left. So public service reform is one thing, but set against a backdrop of increasing cuts in services. And did he finally, did he read the report by Spice, the University of Glasgow and Herrick Watt University, into the impact of the cuts in local government in last year's budget, which clearly showed that there was a disproportionate impact on the most poorest and most vulnerable in our communities. Will he this year, in looking at the settlement for local government, ensure that there is a proper impact assessment on how and who it will impact most? Minister. President officer, the Scottish Government has treated local government very fairly, uh, despite the massive cuts to the Scottish, gov Scottish budget from the UK Government. Fact! Absolute fact. You would be more, it would be more apt for you to point the finger at them order, for continuing please, to cut order, our budget here in Scotland. Instead of carping from the sidelines, Excuse you should be me. joining us in fighting Tory austerity. But Minister, instead, Minister, your, Minister, your Westminster colleagues Minister. marched through the lobbies uh, with, to sign up to George Osborne's austerity compact. You should be ashamed of that. Question number three, John Mason. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to research carried out by Harriet Watt University regarding ways to reduce income and other inequalities. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. President Officer, the Scottish Government pays close attention to research on reducing inequalities and welcomes this research which supports uh, the rationale behind one of this Government's key priorities of extending the provision of free early learning and childcare. This includes increased provision for all three and four year olds to 600 hours per year, extended provision to include over a quarter of two year olds and we are committed to nearly doubling free early learning and childcare entitlement to 1,140 hours per year by 2020 and this will save families over £3,000 per child per year. In addition, our Fairer Scotland Action Plan outlines 50 concrete actions we are taking to tackle inequality and uh, to create a fairer Scotland. John Mason. Uh, I'm grateful that the Minister uh, talks about uh, helping women into work through childcare and uh, other such ways. Uh, can she also confirm that the Government will be tackling the gender pay gap, which is mentioned in the report? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, 
Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, as Mr Mason rightly recognises uh, the importance of childcare in uh, alleviating uh, pressure on family households and the cost of living uh, with entitlement free at the point uh, of need uh, and also in terms of freeing women up uh, or freeing women in particular up to enter the, the labour market. Uh, but he raises an important point um, in and around the, the pay gap. Um, the research that he mentions uh, along with investment in early learning and childcare uh, also identifies the importance in policies that close uh, the gender pay gap and I'm pleased to say uh, that the evidence published by ONS a few weeks ago shows that the pay gap, the gender pay gap in Scotland is continuing to fall. Uh, we outperform the UK but the fact that we still have uh, a pay gap it means that we need to co continue with our work on occupational uh, segregation. Uh, we need to continue uh, the work in terms of encouraging public and private sector uh, employers to publish information uh, on the gender pay gap uh, and uh, we need to of course uh, do the long-term work to encourage more women uh, to pursue and remain in STEM related careers. John Mason. Uh, I thank the Minister for that uh, response as well. Uh, I mean, I think we all believe that we should grow the economy, but uh, up until now, the gap between those who have a high income and a low income, uh, who are richest and poorest, uh, has been unacceptably large. Uh, can the government confirm that as well as growing the economy, we are committed to reducing these gaps between the richest and the poorest? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we know that inequality has uh, a very negative effect on economic growth and according to uh, the OECD, uh, rising income uh, inequality between 1990 and 2010 uh, actually reduced uh, the UK economic performance by nine uh, percentage points. So that's why uh, inclusive growth is central to this government's uh, economic strategy and to our approach uh, to a fairer Scotland, making sure that we tackle inequality so that everyone can benefit from a more prosperous uh, economy and that obviously chimes uh, with the research published by Heriot Watt University who as well as talking about investment uh, in early learning and childcare and endeavours to close the gender pay gap, they also talk about the importance uh, of regionally balanced uh, economic growth and that is reflected both in our economic strategy, the labour market strategy uh, and also uh, in terms of some of the work uh, within the Fair of Scotland Action Plan which is very pragmatic uh, and contains 50 concrete actions that are about tackling uh, poverty and inequality in all its forms. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Members. Uh, we'll move on to the next item of business, which is debate on motion 2488 in the name of Keith Brown on the single market and trade union. Sorry, point of order from Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, I, uh, I rise to make a point of order regarding an inaccuracy of factual information provided to Parliament on Wednesday of last week. As I understand the guidance, members, including ministers, have a personal responsibility to be accurate and truthful in their contributions during parliamentary proceedings. Parliamentary proceedings includes answers to oral questions. The Minister for Transport and the Islands, in an answer to an oral question, told Parliament that his plan for a bill on railway transport policing was an SNP manifesto promise. He said, and I quote, we were elected on a manifesto promise to do what we are doing. Following this answer, I checked the entire contents of the SNP manifesto upon which the Minister was elected. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere did any such promise appear. Can I therefore call, nay demand the Minister comes to this Parliament at five o'clock tonight to set the record straight at decision time this afternoon? I thank the member for his point of order and thank for the advance notice too. I would, uh, uh, first of all, uh, make a number of comments. Uh, if the member believes that uh, any member has uh, not been fully accurate in their comments, then they are able to make a number of uh, interventions themselves. They can intervene on the member when speaking, ask them to correct themselves. They could put the matter in writing to the member, ask them to correct it that way. They could, if relevant, lodge a motion or a question uh, for debate and of course it's up to all members if they wish to raise matters in the media and in terms of procedure if any member realizes that they have uh, given incorrect in information in the contribution to the chamber they can request that information is uh, addressed in the official report i hope that addresses 